All right. Well, now we're going to be uh, talking about character of river channels. What are some of the things I'd like you to know about river channels that uh, may not be obvious in all of the books uh, based on my professional practice and experience? Um, you've probably seen these kinds of images before uh, out of uh, physical geology and geomorphology text. This is uh, looking at the stages in maturity as a landscape evolves. So you start out um, with a narrow V-shaped valley when you have rapid uplift or rapid downcutting. They usually two go hand in hand. Think of something like the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so the source area the, where these rivers come from. You're going to have steep uh, V-sided canyons, except where they're glaciated, then they're going to be a U-shape and, and, and filled with glacial detritus. And um, you're going to have a lot more um, frothing and oxygenation of the water coming down this, steep gradients, uh, lots of tributaries uh, coming into it, and um, lots and lots of landslides and changes in bed form. As you get out uh, into the flatter areas, uh, say across uh, um, uh, Nebraska, Kansas, places like that, you're going to start seeing lower gradient. The stream's going to slow down and it's going to have these twists and turns as it conserves energy through entropy. And you're going to see incision. You're going to see these terraces. And this terrace defines, the, the lowest terrace defines the active floodplain. So you always want to be aware of the terraces and their location and realize that the river is going to be um, having active erosion where it goes around these turns, especially on the edges over by the terraces. And these rivers can move around uh, dramatically prior to the channelization activities of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, which started in the early 1930s. Uh, if we get down on the flatter areas now, we're in the Mississippi embayment below Cape Girardeau, on down through Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Louisiana. Uh, you're going to see a much flatter gradient now, and the river is going to be um, lazily moving around. And this uh, system now, you're going to get a floodplain uh, on the Mississippi River that's as much as 100 miles across the active floodplain. So just tremendous. A scale of things, and um, and the river is going to be the active river channel is going to be the high ground, and so when this thing spills over, you're still going to get undercutting in places like this, and you're going to get uh, the river uh, migrating on the outside of these bends, depending on how well they can protect them and armor them. But when these things break, uh, this ground around them in the floodplain is actually lower than the river channel banks, and so this whole area is going to flood when that occurs. So if we um, look at confined bedrock channels, this is some of Luna Leopold's work uh, in, in the uh, late 40s and 1950s on the San Juan River near Mexican Hat, Utah. And uh, what we see here is we have a confined, this is greatly vertically exaggerated now, but we have a, con we have a, a major perennial channel in a very um, semi-arid environment. Uh, this is a tributary, one of the major tributaries of the Colorado River, which comes in now to what is Lake Powell. And so this is coming out of southwestern Colorado and north, uh, uh, east, northwestern uh, New Mexico. And you can see here the normal flow, and uh, you can see the channel fill here, and the channel fills quite considerable. Um, and it's going to be you know, something on the order of 15 feet of channel fill over a bedrock channel. And there we are, September 9th. We got a base flow, 635 cubic feet per second. Pretty similar to the Gasconade River right over here near us. Its base flow is around the same number, around 600 CFS. Um, now we're going to have a, uh, a major storm event it is going to be uh, routed through this thing. So, uh, you know, a week uh, worth of storms. And what we see is the stage level coming up tenfold to 6,650 CFS. And when that happens, we're actually seeing a, a bed load escalation. You can see the bed's actually a grating right here, and it's coming up these edges. This is very important. Notice this, because you've got more friction along the sides, and you're confined. 
Now, the storm uh, came up and stayed up, these levels stayed up for another month. And by October 14th, they saw a maximum flow of about 60,000 CFS. So now we've gone up another tenfold, so two orders of magnitude, 600, 6,000, 60,000. And now the gauge is uh, showing everything is moving. So we have suspended bed load condition. And we have some big stuff down here on the bottom, but it's saltating along like a bunch of pool balls. So it's moving along. So everything is taken right down to the bedrock. Now, this was a big surprise when these measurements were made. That's why it got published in so many physical geology textbooks at the time. Um, and so interestingly, now this is the most important part, watch what happens when the flood subsides. The flood starts to subside. Here we're down to about 18,000 CFS. We're subsiding and we're seeing deposition along the sides, but we're not getting back to this position for quite a while. How long? Years, decades. Uh, this doesn't just redeposit itself back to that condition immediately. You get this kind of a distribution. You still got very high Q, very high velocities right here. And so big stuff does tend to fall out to the bottom. You get the finer sandy stuff up the sides. Uh, but we don't see, we don't get back to that 15 feet of sediment for maybe another decade. So when you have a major flood go through a confined bedrock channel, you very much leave a fingerprint, a depositional fingerprint, stratigraphic fingerprint. And that fingerprint is mollified and changed over many years, many decades. So depending what kind of frequency event it is. So this is a 500 year frequency event, the recovery uh, may take several hundred years. If this is a 100 year frequency event, then this recovery may take decades, you know, 20, 30, 50 years. So that's something uh, uh, very interesting. Now, how does this affect us in engineering? Well, you don't have to leap too far. Think about it if you had a bridge here and a bridge pier out here. Bridge pier in confined bedrock channel, bad idea, bad idea. Yeah, why? Because you're going to have to design for some colossal scour effects, colossal scour effects. And that's what we've learned all over the country. You know, we've, we've cheated these channels, put approach fills in, put in piers and big fat piers. And um, what happens is, well, we suffer the consequences. We get a lot of scour damage during high flow events because this is a very turbid and rough and tough environment. These are like a bunch of battering rams working against that bridge pier getting moved around. So, you know, if you're in a confined bedrock channel, the best thing to do is clear span it, baby. I mean, don't, don't even think about putting piers down in some place like that because you're going to be battling problems with those during high flow events. And that's why we see so many bridges fail when we have high flow events. And I say high flow events, it's something above 25 year recurrence frequency. Uh, we get trouble, a lot of troubles. Okay. Surprises. Anytime we muck out channels, we started doing this for Hoover Dam back in 1931. Uh, when we muck out channels, we're going to get surprises. We're going to see things um, that we couldn't imagine. When they did Hoover Dam back in 1931-32, uh, they found this 2 by 6 plank right here. And it was 50 feet beneath the low water surface of the river. That was a real shock. You mean 50 feet of sediment? And this was, it was sawed and sanded. Uh, it, it was dimensioned. So it wasn't natural. And man had only had settlement along this river, um, you know, only since 1867 or so. There was a Mormon settlement at Colville Warsh. And people at the time felt that this was a plank that came from that Mormon settlement, which was only occupied for a few years in the late 1860s. But it was, it was about uh, 30 miles upstream, and they thought that this plank came out of a um, debris flow that emanated from Colville Warsh during a very high flow event 
on the Colorado on June 26, 1920. Now, they never proved that out. We didn't, they didn't do carbon-14 isotope dating in those days. But uh, 210,000 CFS flow on the Colorado River, significant flow, because this same site right here had a 500 CFS flow uh, back in the uh, late fall, early winter, 19. Uh, 11, 1913, both years. So you could have some very low flows. So when they got in here, they had a lot of surprises as they excavated down uh, into the dam site. And we've had surprises at just virtually every dam site. One of the biggest surprises was this inner gorge, which had been missed in the borings. And the reason it had been missed, because when they would drill down into here, they were hitting blocks that were 12, 13, 14 feet across. And they cored those and thought they were bedrock. And so they thought they were actually going to have less bedrock uh, excavation at this site. And that was part of the reason for choosing this site over the Boulder Canyon site, which was in granite. This was in andesite. And they ended up saying, well, we'll have, we'll have less gravel to remove here. In, in actuality, uh, they had to remove 2 million cubic yards beneath the dam itself, which is about 40% more than they expected going into the contract. They, they removed 6 million cubic yards total at the, at the dam site and for the project. Um, so here you can see they're working, going down through these gravels. They get down here to the surface and they find this inner gorge. And the inner gorge is just filled with these fluting structures. Now, the, these are so numerous and so pervasive they couldn't deal with the, a lot of them were overhanging. They couldn't deal with putting mass concrete and getting it all tamped in here and everything. So what they ended up doing was shaving this all back. And that's what you see right here. So that inner gorge was actually more precipitous than you see in this picture. They actually chopped the edges of it off and smoothed it out so they had about a 50 degree slope on the side. And you can see all this fluting structure on the andesite. Now today, just in the last few years, we've actually figured out how this thing got formed, that all the major dam sites on the lower Colorado, the Boulder Canyon site, the Black Canyon site here, um, the Davis Dam site, the Parker Dam site, these are all ancient bedrock dams. They were narrows on the river system that had enormous lakes behind them during the late Pleistocene, and these lakes periodically filled up, tipped over, and carved out these gorges in catastrophic outbreak flood events. So these things were carved very, very rapidly uh, by major geologic cataclysmic floods. And that's how come this whole thing was filled with 15 foot, 20 foot, 25 foot size subangular boulders from the catastrophic outbreak flood. And in fact, at Hoover Dam, up here, you know, the dam's 726 feet high. About 500 feet above the dam, they had a whole series of potholes and rill structures from this flooding event that were discovered back in the early 1920s by Leslie Ransom with the USGS and later at Caltech. And Ransom was the, the geologist of record that mapped all this along with his protege, Frank Nickel. And um, that was the first use of paleo seismology because they had some faults cutting through those uh, pothole and rill structures, and they didn't see any offset along the faults. So there's 26 faults at Hoover Dam cutting the foundation of that dam that are less, all less than 4 million years old because that's the age of the, of the volcanics. Uh, and so were these things active? Uh, no, they didn't appear to be geologically recently active anyway because of the, they didn't offset the, the pothole and rills. And the pothole and rills were filled with upper Precambrian exotics. Shinumo quartzite, uh, bass uh, dolomite, things that have come out of the Grand Canyon. Very, very distinctive upper Precambrian uh, crystalline rocks that were very, very hard rock. In fact, that's, that's a lot of what helped Hoover Dam in terms of the, the concrete now. The average strength, they just tested it a few years ago, it's, it's way up around 7,500 PSI, and that's because twice what structural concrete is. And this was put in as a four-sack yard. It wasn't even put in as a, uh, you know, it's put in as a 3,000 PSI mix, it's up at 7,500 now. A lot of that is because the aggregate is so good. It's very, very high quality aggregate and um, large aggregate, up to nine inch diameter cobbles. Um, 
When we look at a river system, one of the things that Leopold began identifying in the 1950s was the pool and riffle sequence. That natural channels tend to develop a pool and riffle system to reach an equilibrium grade. Now the equilibrium grade is the average grade of the pool and riffle system. So if we look, riffles are where you have little rapids where you like to do your fly fishing. So you have a riffle, you'll have a pool, a riffle, a pool, a riffle, and a pool. And so as you come down lengthwise, this is the Falwag profile. The Falwag is a line along the deepest part of the channel. So over here on this side of the channel, here you'd be over here hugging the bank on that side of the channel. Then you cross over, get closer to this side of the channel, then somewhere out near the middle of the channel, and so on. The Falwag's you know, only in the middle of the channel when the channel's dead straight. That doesn't happen very often in nature. It's man-made channels. But uh, you can see here, uh, this would be a riffle sequence. You're going to get aeration on the riffle sequence, higher velocities, and then you're going to have a lower hydraulic gradient, lower velocities in the pool section. And the pool riffle sequence is very important to sustaining riparian life, because in the riffles you get oxygenation of the water, so the dissolved oxygen content, or DOC, DOX content is higher, which is good for aquatic life. And then the deeper pool area is where you have slowing down and where you can have um, uh, everything can kind of sit down there and, and rest and hibernate even through the winter and uh, things are quieter and you have different kinds of aquatic life that um, survive in the pool area and then you have a lot of activity uh, in the uh, riffle area and of course uh, steelhead uh, tend to, they have to, steelhead, uh, trout, and salmon have to lay their eggs in the aerated zone that's in the riffle zone. Because they have to have a lot of cool water and it has to be highly oxygenated for the, the eggs to, to uh, develop. Now, the other important thing about channels is curve compensation. Um, we learned about curve compensation on the Central Pacific Railroad when they had a stockholders picnic in September 1864 and they took the train out of Sacramento, California uh, northwestward, uh, northeastward towards Marysville uh, across the Sacramento Valley and that's uh, flat as a pancake even though they got paid uh, for building in a mountain zone. The mountains don't start for 60 miles. So they're chugging along and they're doing great and they built the rail line on a constant gradient. Now the, the steepest part of the line is actually climbing up um, uh, in the Sierra foothills and trying to get up on the drainage divide between the, the, the South Fork of the Bear River and the North Fork of the American River at Auburn. So they had about 2% grade. And uh, they thought that, that was fine because the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad back east had established 3% grade as a maximum acceptable grade. So 2% uh, we should be, you know, we should have some safety factor here. And so they got everybody on that train and they had 17 cars on the train with one engine. And they were fine going across the Sacramento Valley. They're chugging along at about 20 miles an hour, which is flying for those days. And um, they get up um, into Penryn and that area below Auburn. And uh, pretty soon the train starts slowing down and slowing as soon as it goes into a curve. And they had this big sweeping curve where they had to come over their first big bridge and the train came to a grinding stop. And everybody scratched their head and I go, wait a minute, 2% grade, we've been on a 2% grade, how come the engine can't take us? And the answer is, you're going around a turn. And when you go around a turn, you have greater friction on the inboard flanges of the wheels. And so when you lay out a railroad line, you have to do something called curve compensation, which is what rivers do, just the opposite of what rivers do in nature. That's why I'm telling you this story. So you actually have to, depending on the radius of curvature, you have to bring the grade down when you go into a curve, or you're going to have too much burn-up, frictional energy burn-up, to get around that curve. And your train's going to come to a stop, like the stockholders. Uh, picnic train. So in, in nature, what happens is channels have their lowest gradient and the flat stretches because they don't have to overcome the friction due to the curvature going around the curve. But when they get to a curve, the gradient, the longitudinal gradient, has to steepen 
to overcome the increased friction of going around this curve and the fall wag moves to the outboard side of the channel. So the deep, fast moving water is over here and that's why the, you get bank undercutting in that area. So if you're gonna build a McDonald's, build it over here. Don't build it over here because this area is the dangerous area. That's where that channel is gonna migrate to in the future. It's gonna migrate out here somewhere. Bad place to be parked. And so then the fall wag comes back, you go to a flatter gradient in the straight, straight section, and then you go into another curve and you gotta increase the gradient. So the natural channel increases its hydraulic grade in proportion to the severity of the curvature. And uh, it does that to compensate for the increased energy expenditure to overcome that friction going around the turn. Now, you talk to fishermen, especially fly fishermen, they know all this stuff. They figured this out. And you, you get a lot of helical flow going around, I talked to you about last time, going around this turn. So when you come around this turn, you, you get pulled under. And there's a helical flow, and that's what carves out that fall wag channel over here. And then this is the bar deposits coming off. You got a bar deposit right here. So you get shallows on the inboard side of the turn, deep water with a helical undertow on the outboard side of the turn. Okay, so if we look in school, a lot of times you know, we look at things like this. This is what these Chinese um, uh, uh, canals, these earthen channels, they cut in the Los over the last thousands of years. This is what they look like. They have a vertical side here coming down, you know, maybe foot and a half, and then they got this beautiful parabolic shape. And that's a, a really nice equilibrium form for a constant Q and a constant hydraulic grade S. And that's the only time you have that is in school and on Chinese irrigation canals. Okay, as soon as you go into a turn, you're going to lose that. When you turn it, you're going to get a more asymmetrical section. So if I take this section, and I do a turn, and the Chinese figured this out pretty, pretty quickly, uh, what's going to happen is your section's going to become asymmetric. So this means you're going around a turn. So now there's the, the center of flow, there's the fall wag profile here. Fall wag moves over well off the center line of the channel. This is really important if you're going to go out and putz around in channels and do dredging work. If you work for the Corps of Engineers, you really need to listen to this because Corps has gotten into big trouble where they go into situations like this and they dredge right here. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose over on this side as they get a retrogressive series of slope failures that take out everything sitting on this shallow bank over here because they just move the fall wag over artificially through the dredging operations. So you gotta be real careful on turns. Now, when you have a braided channel, out west, we have lots of braided channels. So areas that are semi-arid or um, semi-arctic, you know, you get up in Alaska, everything is braided. And that's where you have more sediment, more aggradation than you have stream power to move around. So New Zealand, Alaska, Arizona, all these kind of places, you have this. And these are an enormous engineering challenge because you know, if you really wanted to do it right, you need a bridge to go a mile across the whole floodplain because anything you do down in here is gonna be subject to tremendous revision by the river during high flow. Highly erodible bed, channel changes every time there's a spring runoff. Great fun, huh? And just go down and look at the flood control problems in a place like Phoenix on the Salt River. They just are, every time they get a major storm, even with all those dams, 16 dams upstream, every time they get a storm coming down that channel, trouble, trouble, trouble. Um, so this one is the one you really gotta watch out for. And if you're messing around with turns, realize that's a dangerous area to be putzing around in and don't dredge over here. You know, if you're gonna dredge and restore the channel to its original grade, you're going to be dredging way over here when you're going around a turn. And then you're going to be moving back toward the center in a straight section and then over to the other side as you get on the reverse side of the turn. Okay, here's a good example of what I was just talking about. We're looking at a cross section of the Colorado River and Grand Canyon above Tanner Rapids. So we're actually in Marble, uh, actually in upper, upper Grand Canyon here, mile 68. So we're downstream of the confluence with the Little Colorado. 
And what we're seeing here is a sediment position right here before a major release of water and after a major release of water. So they're actually going to take the Glen Canyon Dam and they're going to make larger releases of water for short periods of time to try and restore the sandbars that have been disappearing in the Grand Canyon since Glen Canyon shut its gates back in March 1963, which I told you about the other day. So here is where the channel was when they were running a maximum queue of 8,000 cubic feet per second, which is pretty typical in the summer when they're running the Francis turbines for air conditioning. They rarely ever get above 11 or 12 or 11, but eight's about, about the normal daily maximum. So all the sand's being lost down here. Now, you run a big queue down through this thing. Uh, you run something, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 CFS, even up to 50,000 CFS. And what happens is this gets scoured out nicely, and you get a lot of the sand redeposited up here. So that actually proved out the theory they had before they ran this test, and it, it, does, it does work. Okay, now this is what I've been talking about. Uh, point bars. The point bars are deposited on the inside of the turns. This is where you're going to have the nice um, cohesionless sand gravel type miscus. This is what everybody wants to drill their wells in and what everybody wants to use for aggregate uh, for pavements and concrete and stuff. And so it's, and it's very short-lived. You can see it come around a corner here, and there's the, there's the point bar, and then it disappears. Then you got another point bar back here, and it's crescent shape, and it disappears. And you got another one over here, and it disappears. Now, I'm telling you this because this is really important for those of you who are geotechnical engineers, soil engineer types, because you love to take, you'll take two borings, and if you get gravel in this boring and gravel in that boring, you automatically get out your ruler, and you put a straight line between them. So if I drill a hole on this point bar, I'm going to hit a whole bunch of gravel and sand. That one, a bunch of gravel and sand. This one, a gravel and sand. And an inexperienced person will just draw correlations between all of them. In reality, these are not connected. They're discontinuous, lobate deposits. Okay, So they're in there in a crescent. Stop, start, stop, start. And so... That's when you get in a floodplain, notice how things are laid in here. Things are not laid in here horizontal. They're all in here on an angle, about a 30 degree angle. Yeah, that's how things are deposited in an active floodplain. They're deposited just like an advancing sand dune, laying over and depositing the sand on its fee angle. Prograding, that's called. It's called cross bedding. So cross bedding is not horizontal. So get rid of your damn ruler if you're out there drilling in sands, especially gravels, sands, anything that's a lag gravel or point bar deposit, and you're out in an active floodplain. These things are pervious as all get out. You put a levee over this stuff, and the water's going to go under your levee like an interstate highway. It just whoops, goes. You know, what's the, what's the, what's the permeability of, you know, big cobble gravel? You know, it's one centimeter, two centimeters a second. You know, sky high. A low one would be like 0.4 centimeters per second. That's still sky high. You're talking about levee stability. So point bars are on the inside banks and due to the lower velocities and increased flow friction going around those turns. And you can see the thaw wag is on the outboard bank. You got all this bank undercutting occurring. And that thaw wag comes and hugs that bank and then moves back, hugs this bank. Going to get bank undercutting. Uh, welcome to the asymmetry that is the geological world of floodplains. Very, very asymmetrical. Get rid of your rulers. Get rid of them. Okay. Now, another big issue that uh, mystified Leopold and a lot of others working in fluvial geomorphology was the whole issue of sinuosity and the development of these point bars. And they started doing lots of tests. These are actually some German tests done in the channel hydraulics back in the 60s and 70s in flumes, trying to see you know, what are the issues that cause a channel to develop a pool riffle. And if it develops pool riffle, you tend to get these point bars.
being deposited, and you're going to get aeration and narrowing and increased velocity as you go around the point bars. And the point bar, this is where the salmon and the steelhead uh, lay their eggs, is in those point bars. So they're very, very important, but they're also, again, as you can see, they're discontinuous. That point bar does not continue over here. This is a different point bar. You have something else here between the two of them. Usually it's a channel sands. And so these things are also laid in at an angle, typically about a 30 degree angle like that, dipping that way, dipping towards the channel. So this one's dipping this way, that one's dipping the other way. Ouch! Yeah? Yeah, ouch. Opposing dips on adjacent point bars. Opposing dips on adjacent point bars. You know, if you live in a perfect world, don't put your levy on a point bar. Stay away from the point bars. Too pervious. All right, what's a braided channel look like? Here's my aborted trip on the, uh, the lower uh, thousand miles of the Yukon River. I'm actually just north of Fairbanks, Alaska here. This is where I actually ended my trip. I got stranded and lost my raft. But um, the, the lower Yukon is just choked with sediment. And so you have, you know, an inch wide and an uh, inch deep and 10 miles wide. And you got all these gravel bars just as far as the eye can see. Here's one in New Zealand. Same kind of thing. And you're, you're going from the wet season to the dry season. You know, they got, they got an incredible wet season down there, six months of the year, um, mid-October to uh, mid-May. It's just just raining like a banshee, and so you have these rivers coming down out of glaciated valleys and just, just taking everything out of here. Now you look at something like that with not a weed growing across this entire channel, and that's telling you, you can see that there's trees and things on this little island here, but that's telling you, whoa, be careful doing anything out here, because whatever you put out here is gonna get impacted. You wanna put a bridge in, put a bridge, clear span from there to there, clear span from here to there. Don't mess around with the area in between because uh, you're going to get impacted by sediment and bed scour. So when this thing comes up and really flows at maximum flow, this entire bed you see here, that entire bed disappears. It's going to get moved a couple kilometers downstream, a few meters to a few kilometers downstream. That whole thing is going to get picked up and moved. You think about the energy involved in that to move millions and millions and millions of tons of sediment. Uh, that should scare you. That should scare you. you. You can put something out here, but you can't put much out there that will, will survive for very long. All right. What's the sediment carrying capacity of rivers? Pretty and pretty simple terms. Sediment. We, we divide it into two components, the suspended load and the bed load. The suspended load is what's up there in the water, and the bed load is what's saltating along, bouncing along like a bunch of pool balls. One transfer of kinetic energy into another one, turns over, hits another one. That's the bed load. You know, fly fishermen who get on waders and go out in very active mountain streams know all about bed load. Why? Because they're standing there and the rocks are moving over their feet like a bunch of marbles. It's kind of, kind of unnerving the first time you ever do it. I remember as a kid, I was 14 years old, first time I went out and did fly fishing in the channel with the waders on and wow, I thought the whole bed was going to bury me and it was just moving over my feet the whole time I was there. Big stuff. So fast moving rivers, this is the Fraser River up in British Columbia, um, on steep gradients are going to have gravel and cobble beds. And you can see lots and lots of white caps, lots of aeration. I have a very steep gradient right here. The river's going over, and it's just picking up all kinds of oxygenation going over this thing. And uh, so this is a very, very long riffle structure, the longest one I've ever seen, actually. And then if we look at um, bed load, and we look at percentage, silt and clay, you can see basically your suspended load is going to be the finer grain stuff, and as you get more coarse grained, um, you're going to get less percentage of the, the finer grain stuff. And so the bed load materials are typically cobbles, cobbles and gravels. 
Okay, how do these things move along? Uh, we have Ralph Bagnold to thank for this. Bagnold uh, was an English scientist. He was a geomorphologist attached to the, uh, the British 8th Army Long Range Desert Reconnaissance Force. Uh, uh, and, and so that's the desert rats. These guys went out and uh, took uh, jeeps and uh, trucks and they went way out around Rommel's lines and did reconnaissance work and then radioed the stuff back. And, and Bagnold noticed that the Bedouins would always sit themselves up off the desert floor. They'd go to sleep at night and uh, they'd get up off the desert floor if they weren't under their real thick goatskin tent. Now their goatskin tents are so thick yet nothing blows through them. The finest, finest powder silt can't blow through it. They're so dense and they shed rain and everything else. They're very, very heavy as you might imagine. Um, but the better ones, when they didn't have the goats, uh, the goat hair tents, they would take a look at what was on the ground, take a look at the velocity, and then they'd decide how high off the ground they had to get. Hmm, pretty smart. And because this is what's going on. Down on the ground, you have these, you have traction forces from the wind, sheer traction. It picks a block up. That block comes down, and then there's a transfer of kinetic energy between this grain of sand and the next one, and it bounces up like so. And this is actually the, 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 the paths you see on here are from high-speed photography that Bagnold did after the war to prove out what he had already learned. Sleep too low to the ground, you wake up with sand inside all your ears. Get up 18 inches off the ground, don't have sand in your ears in the morning. You know, which way do you want to live? And so now that's above the ground, but the same thing is going on down here under the river. The same exact thing. In fact, these pictures are actually from a river flume test that he did. So what we have here is we have the finest clay particles and silt that are dispersed up here. This is your suspended load. And the suspended sediment load is transported by the river's current, and it's aided by buoyancy. These particles weigh less because their, their, their effective weight, just like with debris flows, their effective weight, remember what it is, it's their dry weight minus the weight of their displacing, of the fluid they're displacing. So the, the more turbid this water is, the more sediment that's in the water, the more, uh, the less the effective stress, or the greater, the uh, less effective stress, and so you can pick up more material. So dirty flow tends to make it a dirtier flow, tends to make it an even dirtier flow. And you really see this with dispersive clays. If you have a river that flows through a shale unit that has dispersive clays, like the San Juan River, uh, the Brazos River in Texas, the Little Colorado River, the Missouri River, all the, the gigantic silt load rivers in North America, uh, the big driving force in them is dispersive clays because dispersion causes that clay to be dispersed and uh, in this um, flow all the time. It increases the density of the flow. And so that's the suspended load portion. Now you know you have dispersion if you look at the river and you look at the lake and it's cloudy. It has a brown, murky, or a red, murky. It's, a cover, it's colored by the clay, and, and it just doesn't settle out after a couple days. That's dispersive clay. And it's a big issue in arid areas and semi-arid areas. Uh, the re reason the Colorado River is called the real Colorado is it was red mud. The whole, you know, you get into June, or in July, August, September, when you have the um, afternoon thunderstorms that come up off the Gulf of Mexico, uh, that river is just running blood red. And it's mostly coming out of the, um, the Little Colorado River Basin. Now, bed load is down here. This portion is the bed load. And there's all that saltating stuff that builds up on your feet when you're fly fishing in your waders. There it is. And what it is is that stuff is bouncing along like this. One billiard ball bouncing into another, transfer kinetic energy, bouncing into another, bouncing into another. So here, the coarse grain fraction, the rocks, are moving along by rolling, sliding, and saltation. This is saltation. Saltation is where you pick up, hit, transfer, pick up, hit. 
Sliding is where you're just moving along a little bit, imbrication. And rolling is just rolling over. Now, you get a lot of rolling that occurs in any steep gradient mountain stream. All right. Another pretty obvious factor we learn about in channel hydraulics is bed traction. If we actually look at the distribution of velocity with depth, um, we don't have the highest velocity right up here at the surface because we have the friction of the air up here. So the velocity actually reaches its peak slightly below the surface. And then it decreases and decreases as you approach the bottom, depending on the friction you have down here and the, uh, the depth of water and the hydraulic gradient. So if we look at it uh, from an energy point of view, we have some hydraulic gradient S here. We have bed shear, bed traction. We have to overcome down here in this transition zone. And uh, we call that the boundary shear stress. So what we're looking at here is the, is the distribution of the boundary shear stress. And um, this is for a uniform density current, like the one I showed you the other day going into, the, um, into Lake Mead. So if you have a density current moving along here, it has to overcome some bed shear along this transition zone, and then everything above it is just moving very, very efficiently on very, very low, almost non-existent gradients because this material is a denser fluid than the material which it's flowing into. So the density current is the uh, very um, sediment-rich, nutrient-rich, heavier fluid shown in dark blue flowing along the bottom of a reservoir and the reservoir is shown in the lighter blue. Now, it turns out density currents are very typical in deltas and large reservoirs. All the large reservoirs now, we've, we've actually seen these things. They, they don't occur all the time. You have to have a big density dump into the upper end of the reservoir. But, uh, and that may occur you know, once a year, twice a year. It may be less frequent than that. It just depends how many dams are upstream. Uh, from the reservoir, but density currents are the dominant mechanism by which we get filling of reservoirs in arid and semi-arid areas. That's the thing that brings down the large volumes of sediment and deposits it across the whole reservoir floor right up to the dam. Now at Lake Mead, remember that's 116 miles. So this stuff dumps in and quickly gets subducted down and it's on a gradient of almost nothing for 116 miles. That's, that's pretty amazing to think about. And what happens is the reservoir fills up just, uh, just flat as a pancake. So you look at Lake Mead today, they've had over um, 150 feet of sediment accumulation next to the dam, but it's just flat as a pancake from the dam upstream into Boulder Basin. It's just, just been filled in flat as a pancake by these density currents. So dominant mechanism that the high uh, concentrations of sediment get pushed out. So the other things we use to describe some of these uh, features is competence and capacity. So as, as channel velocity increases, more and more particles can be transported by a given flow, everything else being equal. So we use the terms competence and capacity to describe the efficiency of the sediment transport in the channel. So here is a low capacity channel. Here is a high capacity channel. So uh, what you have here is you have higher velocities in the high capacity channel because you have more Q. And so your boundary effects here are helping you. And you can move a lot more material. High competence, if you look at high competence again, you have much higher velocity in a highly competent flow than you do in a low competency flow. And so what's happening here is uh, you can move a lot more material here because the velocity is higher, given that everything else is equal. So what affects this, again, is these boundary stresses down here and the boundary around the channel. So high competence channel, smooth. Concrete, nice smooth concrete, Manning's coefficient, 0.011, highly competent channel. 
You're going to move things. And so you can have all kinds of dirt and stuff that accumulates in a concrete trap channel. And you get a big flow going through there. And your Manning's coefficients are so low, it's going to pick all that debris up and wash it out of there real nice. As long as you got the gradient about 5-6%, uh, the longitudinal gradient. Okay, we'll stop there for today and uh, pick this up in part B. Thanks.